So, our next speaker is going to be Melanie Unsleber yes. from uh, Simon Kuher, uh, specializing mostly on pricing consultancy, but not necessarily just that. And you, we've had your colleague, Fabian, in the past uh, with fantastic presentations, so the bar is super high. So, ah, thank, <laughs> you, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for coming. And please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm Melanie from Simon Kutcher, and I want to talk to you today about how you can grow your revenue in these chaotic times. Um, <coughs> already yesterday and also today I was asked quite often, Simon Kutcher, who is that? If you don't know who Simon Kutcher is, um, it's Simon Kutcher and Partners. We are a consulting company with 1,700 employees, more or less, and 42 offices around the world, so very global and we have a full focus on top-line growth, so we help our customers to grow their revenues. And um, I am working in our software and internet department, and I'm fully specialized in online platforms, and here on the left you can see some of our clients, and on the right are some projects, typical projects, so we um, often deal with growth strategies, how can we grow our business, where should we expand to. Um, we often talk about offer and pricing adjustments, packaging topics, um, but also things like market sizing um, or commercial due diligence, cooperation between platforms and so on. Um, the last time that I talked at a conference was um, 2019, so autumn of 2019. And um, before that, the time was very, or the, the conditions were very stable. So um, it was very dominated by growth. We had a strong growth, typically in most of the markets, growth of listings, growth of traffic, growth of prices. And to be honest, it's not so difficult to grow your revenue in these conditions. But that changed a lot. And I do not want to go too much into detail here because I think most of you remember quite well what happened in the last th two and a half years and also um, what still is going on. Um, maybe a little focus on cars and real estate. Um, in, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, um, the demand dropped significantly. So there was huge insecurity, nobody wanted to buy a new car because they didn't know whether they may lose their job or not. So the demand dropped a lot and um, yeah, of course we also had some, some lockdowns so some dealerships could not um, open up, demand down and the, there was a huge crisis also among the dealers. And most of the platforms, of the car platforms reacted and they gave huge discounts to their customers, to the dealers. And of course, you can directly see this in the revenue. So here, for example, auto trader revenue decreased year over year by 32%. And we see the same for car gurus. Also here, a huge drop in the revenue. And they also lost many dealers, 10% of the dealers. Um, and they have really a hard time recovering that now. That was the situation at the beginning of the crisis. Now it looks a little bit different. After the demand shock, now we have the supply shortage. So um, the OEMs could not produce anymore, spare parts were missing, were hanging somewhere in, in China or in, in Shanghai. Um, of course, if you cannot sell new cars, which you can see here, new car registrations went down. If you cannot sell any new cars or if you cannot buy new cars, then you also don't sell your old car. So also the used car registrations went down. And of course, this is an issue for our car platforms because the number of listings decrease a lot. Numbers went down. On the other side, typical market reaction, if the supply goes down, the prices go up. And this is what we see here. Used car prices increase significantly. And in the end, for the dealer, for our customer, this is not the, bad, uh, the worst situation, right? So they do not um, have to give so many discounts. Their margins get, went up a lot and they actually make quite some money. That was situation in the car area. Now, if we look at property verticals, there the reaction was not that clear. So the platforms reacted a little bit differently because 
we also had a discussion yesterday, um, some, in some markets there were not so um, huge changes for the agents and actually there were no reasons why we should decrease the prices and because they could continue with their business. Um, in other markets, right move, I think many of you know this example, um, they had to give huge discounts, they hesitated at the beginning, but then they had to give huge discounts. And again, we see huge revenue drop. On the other side, Immoscout in Germany, they were not giving too many discounts, um, mainly discounts for privates, and they were able to keep their revenue at least. Not much growth, but at least they were able to keep their revenues. Um, Transaction-wise, so if we look at the supply, um, we always, so in the real estate area, we also, we, all the time we had a supply shortage. The demand was always much higher than the supply. Um, but the supply, after going down a little bit at the beginning of COVID, now we can see that the supply goes up a little bit again. So the supply is increasing, but on the other side also because um, there is much more demand than supply, the prices go up. They go up a lot. And again, actually a good situation for the agents. Um, but now with the higher interest rates, and we have this on the bottom on the right, um, with the higher interest rates, it's not so clear what happens now. Um, higher interest rates means many people might not be able to afford a house anymore, so the demand could go down. On the same side, the supply on the market could go up because maybe some... Um, credit uh, or some, some fin financing um, does not work out anymore, so the houses come to the market. So let's see what happens there. The thing that I wanted to show here is, whereas two and a half years ago, we had those stable conditions and not so much change, and since then it changed a lot. The market has become super dynamic, um, super many things going on, and uh, we need to be flexible and really react to it. And what I wanted to show today is that, in my opinion, you need to look at two and monitor, constantly monitor two different topics. The first one is the customer economics. So you need to understand how much is the customer actually making with the listings on your platform and how much does he have to pay for, for you. So um, it's basically the return on investment story. So we need to understand what is the return on investment of our customers when they list on our platforms, um, because the customers will know. Some of them will, maybe they cannot tell right away what the return on investment is, but they will, in the background, many of them will track it and if it's not ideal for them anymore, and if there is a good competitor, then they will churn. So what we do very often in our projects is we look at it from the other side. Basically, we say we want to understand um, what is the share of the profit that the dealer makes on our platform, with listings on our platform, what is the share that we actually take from that? So it's the profit share that we often calculate, and we look at this, um, yeah, for, or we have done this for several platforms now, the levels differ a lot, um, and especially very interesting is that um, within one platform, the levels between different segments differ a lot too. So you always have some customers that where you only take maybe 1% of their revenue that they earn, and then there are other customers where you actually take 20%. And that's quite interesting to know. So at first, we use this information. If we look on the average, um, what is the profit share that we take um, and compare it to other similar platforms and similar environments? Does it make sense? Can we increase a little bit more? Maybe are we under monetized or not? So the overall level is interesting. And the other one is, um, where are the segments where we think we are at a limit? We should not increase more because if we increase the monetization, there is a high risk that they churn. And where are the segments where we see there is more potential? And I wanted um, yeah, to give you this one example of 
um, one differentiated price increase that we recently did for one of our customers um, where we basically just did this analysis. We under identified the segments where we think we can increase the prices and the segments where we think we should not do that. And we did um, increase the prices of by about 20% for the customers that had a profit share of 1%. So instead of paying us 1% of their revenue or of their profit, um, they paid us 1.2%. So that really does not hurt anyone. And on the other side, where we had 20% already, we did not increase at all. And the reactions to the price increase were very good. I mean, nobody likes price increases. Nobody likes to pay more. Of course, there were complaints. There are always complaints. Um, but we did not have any churn or not any incremental churn. So this shows that it's, that really helps if you understand where can I increase more and where should I be a little bit more cautious. And on the other side, if you understand this f for me or for us, it's really the base. You need to know what is the return on investment of your customer to get into good conversations with your customers. Right? It should not be about feature X, feature Y, or um, just about prices, but it should really be about what is the investment that you make on the platform and how much do you get in return. And you need to know the cross or the profit share or that to have these discussions and also to help your sales team um, to have good arguments for price changes, for example. So dealer or customer economics is very, are very important. And the other one, especially in the last two and a half years, are the supply and the demand development. It's super important to know where are you at the curve of the supply and demand. So this is automotive uh, or sending for automotive. So we saw a huge supply decrease in automotive. And that at the beginning of the year, we thought, well, maybe we are at the bottom, so we thought we are somewhere at the bottom, and that at, towards the end of the year it will increase, and if um, the number of listings increase, then again we have a nice growth story and we can out increase our revenues as well. Um, but then the war started and now this looks different. So this constantly needs to be monitored and you need to understand where you are on the curve. Again, an example, um, we Last year, we did a project typical, typically, um, or a typical packaging and pricing for one of our customers. So we changed something to the packages. We had good, better, best packages. We improved um, the packages. We increased the prices a little bit. Um, we launched the new products and prices, and the revenue went up. So there was quite a good reaction, and everyone was happy and satisfied. What they did not see that was that in the background, the customers tried to downgrade their slots because they did not have enough inventory. And of course, on the one hand, if, if we change the packages and prices and we increase the prices a little bit, then the customers, the dealers or the agents try to save money somewhere else. And um, the first thing was they tried to see where can I save and they downgraded their slots. Um, but the platform didn't see it. So there were some signs and they saw that something is going on, but they did not see the extent. And um, it was quite significant, the downgrade. Um, so if they would have seen it earlier and taken measures against it, their revenue increase would have been even stronger. But they were just too late. And this shows that you really need to go into detail and understand exactly what is happening and what is going on on your platform. Great. So if you measure that um, and understand that, um, I now want to go into and have a look at different revenue models. Um, I selected four different revenue models and would like to at first explain a little bit how they are and then also how sensitive they are to revenue and to demand, uh, sorry, how sensitive they are to supply and demand changes. Um, and then also in the next step, show you what you can do for your revenue model in the different situation um, to make sure that you still grow also um, yeah, if the demand or the supply changes. 
One of the typical models is a slot listing model postpaid, which means um, the customers can list what they want. And um, the platform tracks how much they list and charges afterwards for the amount that they listed. The next one is the classical subscription po uh, prepaid model, where at the beginning of the contract period, which is often 12 months, um, the customer selects a certain amount of listing or tiers that he needs during this year, and he keeps that for the rest of the year. The third one is a customized flat fee, where we tell the customers that they can list basically whatever they want or how much they want, and the price is calculated based on many different individual factors. <coughs> and the last one is a pay per lead model, classical pay per lead model. Let's have a look into at first the first one, the, pre, uh, the postpaid model that Mobile, for example, has in Germany, um, which means you, um, the, the, the dealers can list whatever they want. Afterwards, uh, Mobile looks where are they in the range, how many slots did they use, and they charge accordingly. And of course, this means, and it's a monthly calculation, a monthly um, billing. Um, and of course, this means that when the supply goes down, so the number of listing goes down, this is directly translated into revenue changes. So here, we, if we look at the monthly revenues, they will go up and down and up and down, which is good if, um, or of course, it's nice if they go up, but not so nice if they go down. And demand does not have any change in that, uh, does not have an impact on the revenue in this case. If we look at the prepaid, the typical subscription model, where we have this fixed contract, often for 12 months, um, but also based on slots or listings, it's like that, then we, um, it's not that fluctuating that much, right? Because we ha always have uh, the contracts fixed for 12 months, but still, um, you always have some customers, some co cohorts of which um, the contract is um, ending in this month or that need to renew the contract and those customers then typically downgrade if they get the chance. So if the supply goes down and um, you see over the time then typically the slot utilization or the utilization of the contracts goes down, you can see this ni very nicely in the numbers and when the contracts are for renewal then they downgrade and then you have the impact. So it's a little bit smoother and um, more equal the revenue income, um, but you have the negative effects as well. If you look at the customized flat model, um, maybe this needs a little bit more explanation. So here it means we have a good, better, best package as well. Um, and the, you tell your customers you can list as much as you want, choose a package, you can take um, the basic package or the professional package, and um, then in the background, we calculate your price. And often there are different price influencing, uh, influencing factors. Typically, number of listings or some volume component is there. Often we also have a demand component like um, performance or traffic that the customers get. Um, in the real estate area, we often have region or object value. In the car area, it would be car value. So this means um, it is calculated in the background, also in a black box. So typically, the transparency of the factors towards the customers is medium. So you would not explain all of the factors, but you give some insights on what influences the price. And the good thing here is that ideally, in, um, ideally it is already integrated, so you use the profit driving factors for the customer in your model. So if you think back of the car example, we see the number of listings went down. So here we move from the tier four maybe to tier two. But on the other side, if the number of listings go down, the prices go up. So we have object value, we would go up and have the higher factor. So this whole model um, balances itself and aligns your revenue or your prices with the dealer, dealer's profits, if it works well. And you also here, it's the first time that where we have the demand component. So here, if the demand goes down, then this also has an impact on your model. 
overall this whole model because you can influence it a little bit better. It's a black box, so if you see it's going into a wrong direction, you change something to the model and then you can influence the revenue. Um, this shows that it makes it much more robust, robust towards um, any changes. So on the right, the ImmoScout example, um, ImmoScout Germany, um, and I just looked in, into one of their financial statements um, where you could see that the number of listings decreased and also the traffic decreased and they also showed it um, in the statement, but they also said at the bottom um, this effect does not have an impact on our financial figures, especially due to the contract model and fixed memberships. Right. And also, if you remember what happened to ImmoScout, I showed this example before, they were the ones that could even grow a little bit during the COVID times. For sure also has other factors. Paper lead model, um, here we have, um, this is very, very sensitive towards both. So if you don't have any listings, then of course you don't have any leads, so your revenue goes down. But also, um, if just the demand goes down, then you also have a problem here. So um, in this case, like car sales, um, it's very, very sensitive to all changes to demand and to supply. All right. So next and last part for my presentation, what can you do? Because actually, I know that many different platforms have different models and decided consciously to take this model or the other model. And we have seen now that some are more sensitive to the adjustments than others. Um, but still, for all of the models, there are ways how you can adjust it. What you can do when you measure and see that the demand goes down, the demand goes up, the supply goes down, supply goes up. So here are some examples for the first one, where we have the postpaid model, which is very sensitive so to supply changes. Um, what you can do is if you ba at first just um, base the calculation on the number of listings, that is the standard um, model, then uh, you could introduce a value factor. Again, reflecting the economics and participate in the rising and in the increasing prices. That's what we've heard yesterday, for example, right? Um, you could adjust the tier structure. So typically you do not sell one listing, two, three, four listings, but you tell, sell 10 listings or 20 listings. And often it helps if you work a little bit with the tiers. Um, typically, if the supply goes down then, and you fear that it, people start to downgrade, then you should widen the tiers. And if the supply goes up, then you should narrow down because then you can um, profit more from upgrades that happen automatically. Um, what um, also happened, and I think Mobile is currently doing it, they have a slot model, but they see that um, because the, the demand is so high, supply is low, so the duration on the platform is very, very short. So the slots, they, the customers use few slots to list many um, cars in this case. So what they did is they introduced an additional fee, or they currently introduce an additional fee. Um, so they have a slot model plus a fee for each listing uh, to participate in this cycle. And, um, and to profit from the shorter um, listing durations. Um, it could help to think about changing the time frame of the calculation, um, to change the averages, that's a, a typical mathematical topic. Um, you could introduce a minimum charge per month for each of the dealers. Um, and another part that always works, of course, is you can shorten the price change cycles but um, here, I think we should have made a, a, yeah, a cross or a question mark next to it because this is quite risky. So uh, the last one, changing the cycles um, instead of charge or having two price increases um, in one physic, uh, financial year is quite risky and the customers don't like it, but it helps. Um, if you have, look, have a look at the next model, so the subscription postpaid model, the first thing is you should think about your contract terms. What are your contract terms? Can you, if you see that the customers start to downgrade, can you somehow prevent them um, by maybe not allowing downgrades at any time 
but allow upgrades at any time, or by even charging a fee or a fine if somebody wants to downgrade. Again, same as before, broaden the volume tiers, or think about how to broaden and change the volume tiers. Another point um, that's referring to the example that I brought before, so if you change something, increase the prices, customers will try to find ways how they can reduce their bill, and then in this case, we heard that the sales reps typically always said, um, yeah, we, you, why don't you change your tier? You can go to the lower tier. And of course, you should not do that, right? Do not tell your sales team that they should not do that. Um, already mentioned, so ESD over usage, when it goes up again, then we should make sure that um, the customers are not limited by their slot limits, but find easy ways how they can go across or beyond their slot limits by either introducing models, how you can um, pay additional slots or buy additional slots, um, or maybe even by yeah, giving them an upgrade and when they stay there for two months, whatever, um, then they can downgrade again. Or, yeah. And another point that is currently done from, in one of, yeah, from Autoscout in one of the countries um, is if you feel that you are under-monetized a lot, um, and that's what they felt, then changing the metric can help to increase the prices and the price level um, significantly because it just makes everything a little bit more blurry, not so comparable, and going from listings to slots or from slots to listings can then help to make a correction to the level. For the next model, I don't want to say too much because, um, as I said, ideally it's already aligned. This model is much easier to manage, not easier to manage, but um, um, it's not so not so um, influenced by supply and demand shortages or changes, um, but it is um, ideally it's already built into the model. So ideally you don't have to do anything, but the model regulates itself. But um, of course you need to check it and manage it if you need to adjust some of the factors. And you should check if the overall level still works or whether you should modify the, some of the factors. Last part for leads, um, if you see that the demand or the supply goes down and you have a lead-based model, then that's not the ideal model. Try to get away from it. Um, I'm in general not the biggest lead-based model um, fan, but there are alternative models and you can see that car sales is currently trying to offer their customers listing-based models and trying to get them there. And there are often always other options, um, other elements in your pricing structure that you can modify. In this case, car sales has um, different prices depending on the value of the car. So you can think about just changing the thresholds and this could help you to increase the revenue. Or introduce a base fee or increase a base fee. That could of course also help. Cool. So um, a few models, there are super many models out there and um, we could continue to talk about this, but I think it's not uh, yeah, that entertaining. Um, so I would like to summarize what we've learned or what I wanted to, to tell you today. Um, the first one is that it's super interesting or important that you understand the link between revenue and supply and demand. There is a direct impact. We have seen so many examples that happened. Um, and how that influenced the revenue, and revenue is important. You need to monitor the economics of the customers and you need to monitor where at the curve you are at the moment for supply and for demand to be able to react. And you should know that there is some flexibility in each model and you could think about how can I increase the flexibility in the models. The other part is um, what we talk about, talked about here. Um, there is really a strong impact for the revenue, but um, it's not that, that easy. So you need to have a good team that constantly monitors, that constantly works on these topics. So put a good team into place that manages that link between supply and demand, because um, I think this is nothing that can be done just next to other topics. And 
next very important point, I didn't mention that before, but um, what we hear very often is that downward, so at the beginning of the COVID crisis, everyone was very happy with helping their customers, so giving discounts. And um, now if we say now we see the other direction would be needed, so we should increase the prices, then there is some hesitation and people say, well, uh, we just gave some discounts, how should I explain to my customer that I now increase the prices? And we say, well, why not, right? If they are not doing good, you help them, but if they are doing good, then you should also profit from it and then you should also do good. So make sure that you manage into both directions and not just downwards. And the next one, don't be afraid to modify the models, your pricing model, um, because it's not that dangerous and it can really help. Good, so far. Any questions? What is this? What do you mean by this? Increasing revenue, yeah. taking it away, playing with um, the, I mean, your whole presentation of how to adapt in changing times, and in this case, a downward spiral and then managing it back up. Mm -hmm. So if we had played with our revenues and then um, uh, to this extent, we, uh, it wouldn't have worked because only our, only our the, the market leader could have done that. Mm -hmm. So. I think the question that I'm asking is, what do you say um, to someone like me mm -hmm. who is not a market leader and doesn't have the luxury to put into practice this theory? Mm -hmm. I actually think that this does not only, um, it's not only relevant for market leaders because we also have both, we have market lead leaders as customers, but we also have um, customers that where we see a duopoly or um, that are followers even. Um, I think still it's super important that you understand the economics of the customers. Um, it, it's important to understand what is their return on investment and this gives you a chance. Also maybe try to compare it to your competitor and um, think about what do I think, what is the return on investment with them, what is it with us and where are we. And um, also all the other measures, so of course it's a little bit more difficult if you are in a competitive situation, um, but if you see most of the things are not even seen by the customers. So of, I would say if you are in a strong competitive positioning, then doing the, some moves like um, reducing the cycle of price adjustments maybe would not do it. Or um, introducing an additional fee on top, um, yeah, be careful, maybe test it with some customers. But there are other things in there that you can definitely do. Many things that your customers won't even notice. So if you change any thresholds um, within your system somewhere, it's typically not noticed. Or if you change something, so there, and also contract terms, there are many things that are not very obvious to the customers, and this is a nice thing about that. Thanks for, for an excellent presentation. Um, my two favorite companies, uh, Zillow and Car Sales, favorite in the sense that they monetize better than anyone else. Both do pay per lead. Mm -hmm. why, why are you not such a fan? Um, in general, I am not a big fan of pay per lead because um, for me, at first it's very f uh, fluctuating a lot. And for me, um, the heart of a platform is um, basically the algorithm and the matchmaking. 
And I think that um, the target of the platform should always be to find the best match as soon as possible and to increase the lead quality. So um, if the platforms work towards that, towards increasing the quality and decreasing the quantity, uh, but you charge for the quantity, for the lead quantity, then this means that you charge for a decreasing um, metric and you have troubles and have to increase prices afterwards. So this is one point. Um, so basically relying on a decreasing, decreasing value. Um, the second point is that we see that very often the customers, there is a lot of ne uh, negotiations with the customers. The customers complain what is actually a lead. So if you talk about leads and want to sell leads, um, you need to have a process behind it to make sure that it's, there is a high lead quality um, and also yeah, that you, your customers need to trust into the lead quality. Um, and yeah, often this creates, if we talk about custom or platforms that currently have a typically, typical slot or listing based model, at first many of them cannot have even measure the leads. That's the first um, problem. Um, and then their customers won't accept it. I, th I mean, there are there are <laughs> there are even technology vendors that 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 sponsor the conferences, which do very good services. I'm not going to plug any of them because I'm, I'm I'm not involved, but but which are very good at capturing those calls and dealing with with um, contested points. And I think the other thing to rem to remember is there's also ability to to price leads above a certain quality threshold in terms of you know, so so qualification. So. If for operators that can have the resources to to do that kind of optimized follow up, and who um, are also able to 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 monitor leads quality, would you then be more enthusiastic? Yeah, okay. yeah definitely. So I would say it's mainly um, my hesitation mainly comes from um, seeing the problems that rise when you move from a slot listing based model towards a lead based model. Um, with capabilities of the platforms and um, also the flexibility of the customers to accept that. Because in every survey, everyone says, I would like, they say that I want to be charged for a transaction, yeah. so even going further. But they also, of course, ev all customers also like leads. Um, so dealers, real estate agents, they also like leads. Um, but if you then try to go and implement it and go into detail, then it becomes very difficult. Any more questions? So one very quick one from my side. Um, I'd be interested if you've seen platforms that moved from a listing model or a slot model to a, a model where they take transaction uh, commission successfully. Because we've really looked very attentively and have not seen many. Yeah, it's tricky. So I've seen um, some platforms move towards transaction, but often um, transaction offline then. So it's mainly car, yeah, car platforms that come to my mind, um, but many of them then went back to charging for lead, per lead for example, um, because it's super hard to track the transactions. And there are some mechanics behind it. So I think if you, again, if you have the perfect environment, if you have um, other systems and tools that help you to identify when a transaction happened, um, then this could, could work, but otherwise not. And there are always some examples, for example, um, I think it was uh, well, car for you in Switzerland, um, where they were they, and they always say that it was a success, but if you look a little bit deeper, then actually it was not. Right? So they had a transactional model, but um, in the end, um, many of the transactions were canceled afterwards, and yeah, it was just revenue-wise not really attractive. Thank you.